Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, February 14, the Valentine's Day meeting of the uh, Housing and Redevelopment Authority for the City of Edina. And uh, roll call, please, Ms. Allison. Commissioner Fisher. Here. Commissioner Sonton. Here. Commissioner Brindle. Here. Commissioner Anderson. Here. Chair Hovlin. Here. Uh, we have a uh, form of meeting agenda in front of us this morning. Is there anyone that wishes to modify the agenda? Manager Neal? Uh, no, sir. Executive Director Neal? Yes, sir. All right. Um, if not, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the uh, meeting agenda as shown. So moved. Second. second. Got a motion and second to adopt the meeting agenda as shown. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, community comment. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address the HRA on a matter that's not otherwise on the agenda this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor, members of the Council. My name is Hope Melton, 4825 Valley View Road in Edina. I'm coordinator of Edina Neighbors for Affordable Housing. So this is Valentine's Day. And my memory goes back to my dad, who uh, in his very last days talked about, now this is a 94-year-old, a brotherhood of man, of sisterhood, we would say now. <laughs> But I want to say to you how deeply grateful we are for your courage, for your careful responsiveness to the community on the issue of affordable housing, and for your perseverance in guiding us what is through a truly outstanding effort in this community. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. What a great way to start uh, Valentine's Day, or any day. Um, good good morning. morning, Carolyn Jackson, 5716 Continental Drive, and I hate to have to follow Hope, but I was at the screening meetings for the Met Council last night, and I thought you would be interested to know that every single one of the candidates for District 5 spoke about housing. It seems to be something that is happening everywhere and that the Met Council will be looking at. So. I'm just to let you know the news. Someone commented maybe you can affirm uh, that uh, four mm -hmm. of the five uh, finalists for our district are from Edina. That's right, yes. Right. <laughs> yeah, so Catherine Bass, Ron Earhart, Leticia Garderamo, and Joe Gullickson were all Edina residents. I'm like, whoa, we're well, well represented. So, oh. yeah, it was cool. Well, thank you. I'm sorry you weren't in the mix. Oh, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, that's it for community comment. Uh, we have uh, a consent agenda in front of us with a couple of items on it. Is there anyone that wishes to remove an item from the consent agenda? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the consent agenda as shown. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Peter, uh, we got a motion and a second to adopt the consent agenda as shown. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And we're on to reports and recommendations, and uh, Manager Nundorf is going to take the uh, first matter, and that's a request for financial participation. Financial participation for 7200 and 7250 France Avenue, the project that was uh, preliminarily approved by the Council. Test. There you go. Great. Uh, good morning. Morning. Uh, the presentation this morning consists of, of three individual agenda items. First, I have a presentation on the request for tax increment financing assistance, um, which you've uh, been uh, uh, evaluating for several months now. There's two additional agenda items that follow this uh, that would traditionally be consent items, setting up future meetings, those types of things. But they're really those items are really contingent upon this initial term sheet. Um, and so this morning I've prepared about a 15-minute presenta presentation to run through uh, the request, the evaluation. I also added a little bit more information about tax increment financing. There's always questions in the community about, about what TIF is, how it works, why the city would consider using it. So I added a little bit of additional information there as well. Um, this morning our entire team uh, is with us this morning. Um, uh, from the city's side, um, uh, myself, Economic Development Manager, uh, Don Urim, our Finance Director, has helped with our negotiations. Stephanie Hawkinson uh, has pitched in on the affordable housing provisions. Um, uh, our external advisors, our finance advisors from Ellerson Associates, Nick Anhut is here this morning. 
Uh, Jay Lindgren with Dorsey and Whitney is also here from the legal perspective. Uh, and as we go through the presentation and, and for question and answer, we're all available. On the owner developer side, uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Blake Bonjean, the owner and developer, uh, had an uh, emergency this morning and wasn't able to join us. Um, but his uh, representative, uh, his development rep, uh, Michael Margulies, uh, is with us this morning. Michael has been instrumental as we've gone through and negotiated and, and learned more about their request. And then Dean DeVolis uh, with DJR Architecture is here this morning. Um, uh, Dean did a lot of the presentations in, in the past, and one of his colleagues, Sheldon Berg, is also with us. So again, the whole team is here for any questions when we get into that part. See, Bill, before you start, I just wanted to note that um, uh, Commissioner Fisher needs to leave at 8.30, and so I'm hoping that we can get most of our work done by the time he has to leave because we've got some good things on the agenda. Did I say 15-minute uh, presentation? I meant 10-minute no, presentation. Great. Okay. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not picking on you. I'm just kind of <laughs> speaking generally. And, and we need a hard stop at 9 for others of us that have things that we have to do. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, so uh, the, the presentation will be uploaded to, to uh, the website as well. But uh, uh, just wanted to remind folks the history before uh, bef what, what the area around Southdale looked like before. This is the 1951 aerial that shows the gravel pits of Edina. Uh, there was an article in the About Town magazine a few years ago. Um, uh, here's some roads to put it in context. Um, France Avenue went through. It, I don't believe it was paved at the time. 70th Street was there. You'll see on the right-hand side the city of Richfield had grown up uh, about 10 years prior. Uh, but this whole area of Edina um, was basically three giant gravel pits. Here's some landmarks that, again, give it greater context. Um, and then the, the parcels in red are the parcels that we're here to talk about today. Um, in the late 1960s, the Oscar Roberts Company, uh, uh, who owned one of the gravel pits right next to the site, uh, built a new headquarters uh, office for themselves. They were a gravel and concrete block company uh, based here in Edina. Uh, the owners uh, lived here and still live here in Edina. Um, and then just the property to the south that was originally called the Prestige Office Building, built in the early 1970s uh, by the Prestige Development Company. And when those buildings were built, they were uh, state-of-the-art Class A facilities. But that was 50 years ago. Um, the current conditions uh, show the 7200 building. Uh, it's a multi-tenant building. Uh, at best, we could call it a Class C building. Um, if you walk through it, it's, it's clear that it's aged uh, not very well and is very outdated. Um, uh, currently, only five tenants remain in that building. Uh, and the, in recent years, the last five or six years, as the, uh, uh, as the, the future has tried to been des decided for, that property has sold uh, on a number of, of occasions as different developers struggle to find a path forward for that site. The 7250 office building um, uh, typically hosted medical uh, clients, uh, a lot of great businesses there. Um, unfortunately, over the last several years, the parking structure has become increasingly unstable uh, to the point where um, uh, the Edina Building Department is not uh, 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 comfortable allowing the building to be occupied. Um, independent engineers have not been willing to attest to the structural stability of that building. Um, so it's currently uh, unable to be occupied and is vacant. Uh, here are some photos uh, from a recent uh, consultant study that we conducted uh, of the 7250 building. It is the one that is in the worst condition. Uh, that underground parking structure has not aged well and it's, um, it's uh, structurally un unstable. I have two renderings of the proposed project just to refresh our memories. Um, and over the last five or six years, there have been a lot of proposals. Um, the current proposal that secured preliminary approval included both of the properties. And you might recall that in, in past years, we had proposals for one property, but not the other, or maybe the first one, but not the second one. Uh, it was important to the community that if something's going to change there, that they change together and change in a cohesive, compatible way. Um, so essentially, there's three structures built on the, on the site. Uh, two apartment buildings uh, that would front France, and then along the rear as a buffer to the neighborhood would be a series of, of future townhome buildings. The townhomes um, would be the last phase. Uh, those would be for sale units. 
And so typically, the, uh, yeah. again, getting clarification from the developer uh, in, in recent days, the apartments would be built first, the townhomes would be the last unit, uh, or the last things built. And then on the right side of the image is the preservation of that mature wooded area. This is the street level view um, from France Avenue looking into the site. So this is what was approved back in December. I'm gonna run through some of these. Um, so, so what is TIF? And I'll run through this real quickly, happy to answer questions as well. Uh, but tax increment financing is an economic tool that's used in 49 of the 50 states. It's been around um, for over 50 years. Uh, it's been governed by Minnesota statute since the early 1970s. Um, and over the last 50 years that TIF has been allowed in Minnesota, it's been interesting to see how pretty much every year there's some kind of modification or tweak to the state law. And in, in essence, those changes are intended to, pre to prevent misuse of TIF, but also to make sure that it's still relevant and it works for communities. Uh, what TIF es essentially does is create a line um, uh, and, and uh, delineate the current taxes, the, the current tax base of the property. Um, in this graph, it's the, uh, it's the purple area. And then with, when the new development comes in, the tax base grows. It grows significantly. So that's the yellow area. So with a tax increment district, uh, you can capture that growth for a limited period of time and use those tax dollars that are new to the community um, to help fund those public benefits, those public improvements. When the term expires, whether it's an eight-year term or a 20-year term or a 25-year term, that whole uh, amount, the old plus the new amount, uh, is returned to the overall tax base. The uh, state of Minnesota uh, House of Representative Research Department has some really good inf information on their webpage. Um, uh, this summarizes the various types of tax increment districts that are allowed in Minnesota, um, from an economic development district like our Southdale 2 district, uh, renewal and renovation district, the city just created one of those, one of those types um, at 44th in France. Uh, also on this list, the third one down, uh, uh, is a special housing district uh, that the city of Edina was allowed to create that allows us to, to create a 20-year district. That's what, we're, what we'll be proposing this morning. So these are the various types of districts. And then the pie chart on the right side of the table is also from uh, the, the uh, house website, and it actually goes back to the state auditor's report from, from last year. And it shows that throughout the state of Minnesota, there's over 1,600 TIF districts uh, in the metro area, in Rochester, in Duluth, in greater Minnesota. Uh, they're spread all throughout the state. Um, about 50% of the TIF districts are, are generally those larger redevelopment districts. Um, in Edina, Centennial Lakes was a redevelopment district. Uh, that one has since expired and was decertified several years ago. Um, but that shows just the breadth uh, to which TIF is used throughout the state. We often get, get questions about the risk to the city and how the city actually pays for a TIF contribution, where the money comes from. And this chart is provided by Ehlers Associates, and it shows the four typical ways that a community can use monies to fund a TIF project. Um, on the uh, right side of the scale is the riskiest way. That would be to issue a general obligation bond, which is general debt to the community. Um, moving to the left, you, the city could always loan. If there's cash balances available, we could do a direct loan. Those monies are at risk at that point. We'd be like a bank. Um, the the uh, third one from the, from the right, the TIF revenue bond, is also public debt, but it's tied directly to the TIF. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit risky, but not as risky as a geo debt. And then on the far left uh, side of the scale, the, the lowest risk is what's called a pay-go note or essentially an, a giant IOU or a pledge of future TIF assistance. So as the project gets built, when there's something there where, that actually pays taxes, where the city can guarantee that the taxes are there, we make a pledge that when those taxes are paid, we'll essentially return part of those taxes back to the development. Um, so in, in Edina, the pay-go note is the method that is far preferred. In fact, our current policy strongly recommends that we limit the use of TIF to pay-go notes. 
um, the riskier methods, there certainly could be occasions where they're appropriate, but really under special conditions. Um, uh, in the 1980s, the city did uh, accept a little bit more risk in the Centennial Lakes project, where the city essentially served as the landowner for that property. Uh, in that project, I, in my opinion, the risk was worth the reward to turn that gravel pit into the jewel of, Centen of Centennial Lakes Park and all the office buildings, but that's really a rarity. Um, our recommendation here this morning is to stick with a pay-go note uh, option, which provides the, uh, the least risk to the city. Here's a chart that I've used in the past. Um, this outlines the steps that are mandated by Minnesota statute to create and consider the use of a TIF district. Um, I break it down into three key steps. The first is creating the district, actually taking the map and drawing the boundaries on the map. Um, and that basically identifies where TIF could be used for the project. The second step is, is the most, uh, in my opinion, the most important because that actually provides the funding. That identifies the address and the building and what the community is going to get, um, uh, whether it's a new building or a public road or a public sewer or whatever it is, but that's where you're actually, actually defining the tangible project. And then the, the third step is the one that, that lingers administratively for 8, 15, 20 years. That's all the monitoring and compliance. Every year the city has to um, follow up with, this, with the state and the county uh, to make sure that the TIF is on track, that it's meeting its obligations, um, that it was appropriate. If it's appropriate to, to decertify it early, we consider that every year. Um, so that monitoring and compliance um, is really a, a step that lasts many years. But each of these steps are mandated by, by, by uh, the state law. Um, there is not a way to, to get around those. If we want to use TIF, we follow the rules, and that has, historically has been what Adina has done. We also get questions about the but-for test. Um, uh, and again, I went back to the, uh, to the uh, Minnesota House of Representatives uh, research site where they referenced a state legislative auditor report um, about the purpose of the but-for test. And, and that's basically to make sure that the tax increment financing is actually needed by the development. That is not just a handout or a direct subsidy, um, but it's a test that but for the use of TIF, the project would not go forward. Um, now this body, the HRA and the city council are the ones that make that opinion. Um, uh, typically a diner relies on staff and an external consultant to make sure that, that our opinion is the right opinion. Um, but it's also important to note that the but for test does not mean to imply that nothing could ever possibly happen on the site. I mean, certainly you could always put a, a little building or something very low scale on, on, the, on the site. Um, but the but-for test is intended to address the project that's being proposed. And in Edina, we really aim for projects that have a, 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 a nice scale, a scope, and a quality of the project that truly is a long-term benefit to the community. So the but-for te test doesn't ask, can anything ever happen on the site? But it, it's measuring the proposed project that's generally desirable by the community. So in Edina, um, we currently have seven active TIF districts. This map shows the seven that are out there. Uh, the largest one is the Southdale 2 TIF. It will be expiring in, in a few years. Um, and then the red dot shows the, the location of the new one. Also important to note, to note that Edina has used TIF since the, since the 1970s. In fact, that's how the parking ramps at 50th and France were funded, Edinburgh Park, Centennial Lakes. Uh, in the last uh, uh, six years or so, eight years or so, Edina has seen 52 new major commercial redevelopment projects. Um, uh, redevelopment of that scale hasn't happened since there was three giant gravel pits uh, on the, in the Southdale area. Important, also important to, ne to note that the city has used tax increment financing to help five of those 52 projects. Uh, these five projects receive pledges of tax increment. Um, so Adina uses it quite sparingly and only when appropriate and necessary. We're guided in Adina by our TIF policy, which was, which was updated in 2011. That really recommends that we use only pay-go note to reduce financial risk to the city. And we also uh, look to use TIF under limited conditions. And we look at projects that deliver measurable benefits to the general public. 
uh, we, we strive to use TIF to help construct affordable housing because there's also a, a financial gap in those. We also keep an eye for TIF um, to avoid an, an outdated facility from truly having a blighting effect on the neighbors. Um, that's something that uh, over history, uh, there's not been much of an appetite in a diet to let a, one bad building really turn a block. This char chart we've used in the past, um, we've up we updated every year. It shows the extent to which Edina uses tax increment financing compared to our neighbors. Um, so about 3.2% in the green line, 3.2% of the, of the tax capacity of Edina is currently uh, within a TIF district. Uh, that, that's a number from 2018. By comparison, you see a lot of our neighbors some of which have lower uh, numbers on, than us. Certainly Maple Grove and Orono have very little. Um, but then you get other communities, Wyzetta, St. Louis Park, Hopkins, Richfield, Minneapolis, Bloomington, Mound, that are significantly higher than Edina. We've estimated what this number will look like in a couple years because in the last year, the city has created three new districts. They're all small for, for limited reasons, um, but three new districts. And so we, we're estimating uh, that in 2021, when all of these districts are, are on, um, that about 3.9% of our tax capacity will be in a TIF district. These pie charts uh, illustrate that. So on the left side, the, the green pie chart shows that uh, uh, currently, according to the city tax assessor, in 2019, uh, we're at about 3.6% of our tax base is in a TIF district. Um, and then the blue chart on the right shows the land area. About 2.7% of the city acreage is in a TIF district. Um, it is very important to note that that Southdale district um, is the largest district. It's, it's over 200 acres. That expires in 2021. So in 2021, these numbers will go down dramatically. Uh, we'll take about 200 acres and put it back on the tax roll. So even if we take an acre off at 44th and France, an acre off on 76th Street, and potentially five acres here on 72nd, we're still gaining over 200 acres back onto the tax rolls. So in the future, we'll keep, keep the HRA board and the public updated with these numbers. So for the last several months, staff has been evaluating this request from the developer. Um, the developer uh, uh, has been chatting with us about some of their financial needs quite honestly, for over a year, right? As this project morphed and grew and shrunk and, and everything. Um, so the, a lot of those conversations were very short and really didn't go anywhere. But we started sitting down in earnest in December when it appeared that there was a chance that, that there might be um, a solution to, to the right project for this site. Uh, the overall project budget is about $111 million. Uh, the developer has requested a $12 million participation from the city in, in the use of TIF. Um, for the last couple months, uh, we've been analyzing and evaluating that request. Um, one of my eyes is always trained, um, you know, if, this, if the city needs to get involved, what's the minimal amount that we have to, have to uh, be at? Um, uh, but after we've analyzed it, we've engaged with, uh, with Ellers and Associates and their expertise, we do confirm there definitely is a significant financial gap in this project. It, it's more than $12 million. It's significantly more than $12 million. The only way to make this project viable is for the owner to bring in much more equity uh, than would typically occur. Um, the use of tax increment financing can help bridge that gap, uh, and outside grants will also be essential to make sure that this whole project can move forward in the current configuration. So as we've gone through our evaluation, I, it's always important to look at the numbers, right? It, we're, we're not here to talk about the the height or the massing or anything like that, but it's the numbers. So the current conditions, um, the estimated market value is just under $11 million. After full development, uh, we're projecting this uh, to be valued at about 94 million. So that's a growth rate of over 800%. Um, you think about the taxes that are generated today versus the taxes that are generated off of something that's that much larger. Um, it's, it's very significant. We've done a 20-year cash flow of what those incremental taxes look like, because remember the, the base taxes always stay in the pool to go to the city and the school and the county and everybody else, but it's this increment, this growth that we're talking about for the next 20 years. 
And when you factor in, in, in inflation and, and an interest carry cost on that, uh, the value is just a smidge over $12 million, which shows that we can cover the developer's request for a $12 million TIF note. So we're defining the minimum improvements um, because as part of the terms that we're recommending this morning, we want to be clear on what's being delivered. Um, uh, so the whole site would be prepped. It's about 5.2 acres. The developer would deliver the two apartment buildings. They'd be sure to, to include 20% of the units um, priced to be affordable, not for the 15 years required by our zoning code, but they're willing to increase it up to 25 years, which is consistent with our practice of using TIF. Um, in regards to the, to the townhome units, there's been a lot of discussion in recent days on that. Um, the, the townhomes along the western edge are expected to be the last phase built. Those are going to be for sale units, um, and so people are going to buy them when all the commotion is finished right outside, outside their front door. So those are expected to be, to be the last units in. Um, uh, the term sheet is currently written up to, develop, to deliver a pad, just a basic dirt pad that then we'd build the townhomes on. Um, after working with the developer, uh, uh, we are uh, recommending a, a small change to the, to the timeline and to the, to the um, minimum improvements to also include a, a delivery schedule for those townhomes. Um, that's something that's not in the write-up and something we'd have to amend if, if you'd be open to that. Um, but we know that that's an important buffer to the community. Um, it is a little bit different project product, the, the for rent versus the for sale. So um, I think that's why the developer is very sensitive about committing to dates um, because they'll, they'll build a couple and then as they sell, they'll build more. Um, so they don't want to get out in front of themselves. These will be high-end units and uh, delivered uh, as quickly as they can. They're certainly financially motivated to deliver them because that's where their profit comes from. If they don't build them, they don't get their profit. So they have that motivation. <coughs> And then the other minimum, in, minimum improvement um, that I, I believe is 100% is essential for this whole project is delivery of all the easements, right? We've got public easements on about half of this property, and those would need to be delivered before any TIF monies would be returned. So here's a quick summary of the sources and uses, and all this data is pulled right out of the term sheet. I just wanted to put it up here if there's questions. But the entire project is about $111 million dollars. That does not include the cost of building the townhomes, um, uh, but that's that's the site. Of, that's the cost of getting the pad and all the all the apartments built. Um, after reviewing these numbers, the returns, the fees, the cost—they're all within reasonable limits, within the reasonable uh, industrial limits. So we're comfortable with these from a staff perspective. Um, when it comes to to TIF costs, there there's. Um, a provision in state law that is generally pretty broad, in my opinion, um, and that's the table on the left. Um, if we followed Minnesota's law, the TIF law, it could, it could be interpreted to say that there's about $22 million of expenses to be incurred by the developer that are TIF eligible. And that might be great for the state law, but from the city of Edina perspective, we're not as, we're not as broad uh, as the state law would allow. So in, in our mind, we're seeing about $12 million uh, of eligible expenses, and that's related to a couple specific items. That's the demolition and the site prep. It's all the streetscape, imp streetscape improvements, that the shared street, the Wooner, the public realm experiences, the elements that the, that the general public will truly benefit from, the tangible ele elements. The stormwater improvements that help the immediate neighbors, um, the affordable housing, the cost of keeping those units affordable and, and and foregoing the market rent for an additional 10 years, that's definitely something that can be recognized. And then a relatively minor one, but there's TIF-related fees that cost money to negotiate agreements and hire consultants to inspect the buildings and all that. Those costs, um, while, those, while those consultants worked for the city, the costs are passed on and paid directly by the developer, and those are also reimbursable. Um, we also do our homework to make sure that this is the best option. Um, so th this is a new chart, it's not in the, in the term sheet, but um, uh, uh, staff and with the assistance of Ellers has looked at three possible scenarios for this site. Um, because while the developer is proposing the, the two apartments and the townhomes and all that, we, we've got you know, that preliminary uh, rezoning approval, there's always other options, right? Um, so this chart shows the tax outcome 
of those three possible outcomes. In reality, there's probably 80 possible outcomes, but I think, in my opinion, these are the three that are most reasonable and relevant. So in the green, the developer could certainly go and fix the parking garage and update and put new carpet in and rehab the buildings and, and, and put new tenants back in there. Uh, this chart in the green would show the tax outcome of that. That's the lowest part of the chart. Um, they could build two medical office buildings on the site. That's kind of been their plan B for a couple years. Um, not a bad project. Um, that's the red. Uh, we show that in red. Uh, that's the line there. Um, there would be a new benefit of having uh, new, any new construction there. And that's assuming that there would not be TIF in the deal. We're assuming those would be built to zoning code, self-financed. Um, they create a lot of traffic, but they also create a lot of business. And France Avenue is a, bu is a business district. The, uh, the blue bar is the uh, tax outcome if, they, if the proposed project is built with TIF. So you see the blue bars um, for the next 20 years, they, they pretty much mirror that medical office situation. Um, but then when the TIF turns off in year 21, that's where the community really sees the benefit. So, um, you know, at the city, we think long term, we're not just looking five years or 10 years down the road. So um, in staff's opinion, the proposed project with the two apartments and the townhomes yields the best, biggest return for the community, as well as, the, as, well as those immediate public benefits. Here's the same data, just rearranged a little bit differently. Um, the, uh, the red bar is, is the one that's most interesting here. So um, on the left, uh, it shows if, if the buildings are kept as is and just cleaned up, painted, reoccupied. Um, once they're repopulated, we would see a little boost uh, in, from the current condition to the red. If the office, the two medical office or regular office would be built without TIF, that's the two, the two um, lines in the middle. Um, that certainly is better than the existing. But again, I call your attention to the right hand uh, uh, chart that shows us mixed use development. Um, and I ask myself, on behalf of the community, would I want to see a project that ultimately delivers um, about 600,000 in value or a project that delivers 1.5 million in value? And uh, um, from my perspective, I think the proposed project is definitely the, the way to go. So getting to, uh, to our specific recommendation, um, uh, as I mentioned, we've been negotiating with the developer for several months, back and forth, trying to figure out what can make this work. Um, the developer is on board with this and ready to move forward. Uh, staff recommends the creation of a 20-year special housing TIF district. We considered going with a longer district, um, but frankly, the project doesn't need it. Uh, typically in Edina, if, if, if I can create a TIF for 20 years, I want to do it for 20. If I need 25, I do 25. We think a 20-year district can get us to the goal line. Uh, we're recommending a pledge of $12 million uh, uh, issued through a, a TIF note that would be paid from those incremental tax revenues. Um, I did also want to mention that with this special housing district that, that we have in Edina, we have flexibility internally um, of where the monies come from to pay that debt. In the Southdale 2 district, we're currently anticipating to have uh, extra increment. There's, as we know, there's been so much growth right around Southdale. So um, at some point, if we move forward in the next three to five years, we'll probably want to talk about, do we take some of the money that's in the Southdale district and, and uh, pay down the debt on this TIF note if we move forward? Uh, that would save the community interest costs. We deliver the units. Um, it's just an extra bit of flexibility that we typically don't have, so I wanted to bring it up this morning. Also strongly recommend that we pursue grants from other funders. We have two applications in to DEED. We're working on one for Met Council. Um, and then the final recommendation is prepare to move forward uh, to, to write, draft, and then finally execute a full TIF contract or TIF agreement. Um, that would be binding to both parties. That's probably several months down the road later in 2019. Um, there's additional summary about the TIF note, um, but I'm way over my 10 minute time limit that I self-imposed. So um, there's additional notes. We, we would recommend all the same precautions that we always include when we use TIF. The TIF note would only be issued when the developer, after the developer, successfully completes the project. If they don't get funding, if the project falls apart, if it doesn't get finished, 
that's the developer risk, the city is not at risk. When they, when they deliver what they promised, that's when the city would deliver what, what, we, what we promised a TIF note. Um, there would be a look back and a claw back. So um, let's say the project gets built and it's a home run and the profits are, are you know, up to the sky. There's look backs to make sure that the developer gets what he needs. If it turns out he didn't need TIF, the city has an ability to claw back any excess profits. So all the typical safeguards that we always include are also recommended here. Um, I'm going to leave it at that so we have time to, to, uh, to have conversation. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. I mentioned the full city's team as well as the developer's rep is here and the architect if there's any other questions. And with that, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. All right, thanks for that uh, very thorough presentation. I'm going to let uh, Commissioner Fisher go first based on his time uh, constraints. Commissioner Fisher. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, once again, just a great presentation. You're so good at these. Uh, so my concern coming in and just reading all the materials was the townhome development piece of this and that we make sure in our agreement that there is a schedule. It sounds like you're all over that, which is good. Um, I've heard some scuttlebutt but from the neighborhood that they're concerned or their thought is that the townhomes won't be built and that's going to be a surface parking lot back there. Um, I'm assuming there's a, some assurances that we're not going to have parking for some period of time. That's not the program here. Um, so just making sure that that part of the site, um, you know, is on a path. And, um, and I know that's not particularly germane to the TIF discussion, but uh, I think it's important. And my, my, question, oh, my question for you, Bill, is you talked about the costs of, the city's costs of setting up a TIF district is really borne by the project or by the developer. It's not other ta you know, our taxpayers funding you know, our work on this. Is that typical of all of the TIF projects we do? Uh, it generally is. Um, there's been one recent exception, but uh, yeah, typically the city's policy is before we get serious and talk about tax increment, fi tax increment financing, the developer generally uh, writes a check that we hold in escrow, and we use that to pay the survey fees, the consultant fees, the legal fees. Um, uh, so for this project, for example, um, to get things started several months ago, the developer uh, wrote a check for $50,000 that we've been holding in escrow. Um, certainly to create a TIF district and to do, to do all the legal conversation to make sure that we follow that, that state statute, their significant cost. Um, once it comes down to negotiating the full contract, um, there's also costs as, as well. But we, we really, um, in Adina, this is a, the important structure to follow. Um, the, the advisors clearly work for the city to make sure that the city is 100% represented in these negotiations. Um, and usually the developers are willing to, to make sure that those costs are paid. So the, uh, the contracts are with the city, but the consultant pays, or the developer pays those. Great, thank you. All right, Commissioner Stoughton. So um, thanks for the presentation, Bill. I, when I think about these um, tax increment finance requests, there's really three things that are on my mind. The first is the but-for test. We talked a little bit about that. The second is the risk to the city. And the third is what's in it for us. Um, on the but-for test, one of the things that I'd like a little more clarity on from you and perhaps Nick, this um, notion that Commissioner Fisher mentioned about the townhomes, this is news to us that this is not included in this. So um, A, you know, that's an integral part of the project and in my mind, putting my city council hat on that the project that's a the project can't move ahead without that. So we need some kind of guarantees, whether they're in the regulatory side or in the finance side, to make sure that those get included. But with respect to the but for test, I'm interested in whether the analysis was done about, you know, we're talking about the costs side on the two apartment buildings and not the cost side on the townhome, but we're also not talking about the revenue side on the townhome. So I'm wondering, and maybe Nick, you can speak to this on whether we did the um, pro forma analysis, including the townhomes, to make sure that that's not a leak in the bucket in terms of the but for test. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Nick Anhut from Ellers and Associates. As uh, Bill mentioned, we have evaluated the pro forma in great detail. Um, the expectation from the developer is that they're going to be able to sell that finished pad with the parking included and use that as some equity to offset some of the additional gap that is uh, necessary to overcome to finance the overall project. And we have looked at their expectations for what they can sell that pad for, and we have evaluated that. Um, as far as developing the owner-occupied housing, we have not looked at those costs. I think it's still fairly flexible what type of buildings will be put on that pad. They'll be customized to the potential owner, but they will be, they're expected to be very high end and the cost of that pad is gonna require that. Um, so we do have some assurance that there's not a loophole to a future developer on the back end and certainly the TIF is not subsidizing any of those discussions for that uh, piece of the project. Okay, is there any, um, you know, in terms of, um, well, I guess I'll, I'll put out there that I have, I want to make sure that we have whatever we need in place to ensure that that development goes forward. I don't know whether that's conditions to the TIF note or whether that's the regulatory side, but I, I want to raise that issue at this point. I don't, you don't need to answer that, but I want to have some discussion about that. Thank you, Mr. Anhut. And um, I'd be happy to, to address that. Sure. Um, so uh, we met with the developer this morning, and uh, apologies for the oversight or for the miscommunication about the townhomes. Those are always expected to be the last piece delivered. Um, uh, but we uh, perhaps we oversimplified in the term sheet that's in front of you. So um, after talking with the developer this morning, we're uh, recommending three modifications to the terms. Number one would be a change in the definition of minimum improvement to not just require a pad, but something to be built on that pad. Um, we would uh, have a change to the project timeline and put anticipated dates for those townhomes. It's easy to, to, to identify a start date for the townhomes, but since they're for sale, I mean, they could all sell out in six months or it could take five years. So it's kind of difficult to say with how fast the market will absorb those units but certainly we can put in timelines for that. And I think to, to protect the, the, the uh, interests of the neighbors, we could try to build the northerly townhomes first. Those are the ones that are seen from the street, whereas the ones on the far southerly, those are right in the middle of the site. That's really won't even be seen by the neighbors, so we could try to stage that. And then the third element is um, uh, a change in the conditions for the TIF note and the, and the certificate of completion that would, t that would tie the issuance of the TIF note and payment on that TIF note, the first payment, um, to getting something started on the townhome pad. So for example, uh, if they haven't sold it yet, they won't get the TIF note. Um, we still have to figure out what is that trigger? Is it, is it a sale of the pad? Is it a building permit? Um, it'll take us a a longer conversation to, to hammer out that, that specific language. But the developer certainly is willing to put a little bit more clarity uh, into the terms. Uh, uh, my suggestion would be if you're willing to have this move forward, we would add that language and bring it to city council next week. But it would be changes to those three sections of this, tip, of this term sheet. So, you know, I, I'll leave to a broader discussion the right mechanics for accomplishing that, but I think from my perspective, the point is we need something that really works as a practical matter, and obviously um, holding the money is a, is a great incentive for folks. So, um, so and on the but for test, um, you know, I just want to make sure that we're, that that isn't a, um, a loophole, as Mr. Anhut put it, to in the pro forma that says, you know, there's a big profit in the townhomes that we didn't include in the pro forma analysis. So look for that. Um, on the risk, I thought your presentation was terrific. Um, to me, the pay as you go note means that the city isn't on the risk. If the increment doesn't appear, we don't owe any money. So um, that's a good thing. And I appreciate you providing the updated 
percentage of our tax capacity, we're still under 4%, which is much lower than many of our neighbors. So um, I think we're using TIF judiciously. Um, with respect to the what's in it for us, um, can you share, we had some communications this week about the um, property that's dedicated. Can you tell me about what portion of the site is dedicated for public easements? Sure, sure, and I've got a slide up that has a, uh, a, a pie chart that, that shows that. But uh, the existing site has um, a five foot wide utility, e or a stormwater drainage easement um, on the interior of the property. Hmm. So there's no public easement other than this five foot strip for rainwater to fall. Um, the developer is agreeable uh, to, to create and deliver permanent public easements virtually over the entire public realm portions of the site. So um, as this project went through planning commission, there was a lot of, and, and city council, there was a lot of give and take about the, the shared street and the landscaping and the streetscape. The developer is willing to, to issue at no cost to the city a permanent easement along virtually all of those areas. Um, we added that up. Um, it's almost half of the entire property. So, um, they're willing to do a conservation easement and keep those mature woods on the west side of the property. We're still having some conversation whether or not there's maybe a walking trail at some point. We really have to inspect the terrain and see if that's even possible. Um, but they would, con they would issue a conservation easement to the public there for certain. Um, there'd be a permanent easement along all the street edges, 72nd Street, Gallagher, and France. Um, there'd be a permanent easement on that new internal street both the north-south portion and then little, the little east-west stub into France Avenue. They're also offering the easement on that second level outdoor plaza. Um, and when you add all those together, it's a 5.2 acre site and there'd be per permanent public easement on about 2.3 of those acres. So that's about 45% of the site. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a, a physical benefit. Um, other benefits are the parking, we negotiated they would provide a parking easement as well. So if you wanted to go use that plaza or walk through the area or enjoy the art or whatever, whatever you wanted to do there, um, you could park without restriction, um, reasonable restrictions, um, and park there for three days and go, the, go to the airport. But you could um, do that parking. And then also we negotiated a stormwater easement because that's always been an, a, a fundamental problem with this site is that currently the neighbor's stormwater runs into the site and it's kind of worked that way for a while, but now that the developer is gonna be building a brand new stormwater facility, uh, we wanna secure a, an easement to make it legitimate to have the shared stormwater use, so we would have that uh, as well. Uh, important to note that the cost of this work, of building all this stuff, is the developers. The cost to maintain it, and plow it, and clean it, and all those types of things is the developers but the general public would get to enjoy it at no cost. And in terms of the public easements on uh, the Wunorf, the street, the east-west street between the buildings, you know, the France, Gallagher, and 72nd Street, um, is that yet to be determined in the final approval of the PUD? Uh, correct, yeah, we haven't actually written those legal easements yet. So we don't um, know the precise scope of that public easement, I mean, you can, the devil will be in the details on that in terms of how we frame that up. Right. Similarly, we part of the project is the 72nd Street improvements, and that is how far down 72nd Street? So the developer at their expense would pay to, to rebuild the street portion uh, from France to Linmar, so that one block portion. So past their driveway to the next street over, um, they would pay for the landscaping, the curb, um, the driving surface, the sidewalks, all that thing. Um, our engineering department is looking at the underground utilities because if we're gonna redo the street, if the water pipe needs to be fixed or upsized or the storm water pipe or whatever, um, the engineering department is doing a separate study to see if, if it needs to be replaced or fixed. Um, that would be a city cost through, the, through those and, utilities, the water or storm. Right, but, um, and again, like the scope of the easements, that would be part of the final PUD approval. Uh, because we correct. haven't seen anything in terms correct. of the specifics, and I know folks in the neighborhood are quite 
interested in that, and, and I know I've had some conversations with Director Milner about engaging the folks in the neighborhood in the crafting and design and kind of preferences about how we reimagine that street up to Linmar, but even further east eventually. Right. And I understand that's not part of the project, but it's going to be important to to do that the right way. Right. It's my understanding that some public meetings have been scheduled this spring. I don't know the, the dates to so talk about we, some of those traffic calming features. Yeah. And when are we anticipating this would come back to the council at a PUD final approval stage? We're currently scheduled for March 19th to come so back with the final. all of that stuff has to happen before the final approvals. Right. Okay. Um, and then the affordable housing, um, I thought you noted in your presentation that it's been extended from 15 years to 25 years in the what's in it for us category. I think that's good news and I liked the mix of um, the various units, but I thought I saw something in the memo about potentially extending it beyond that. Is, can you elaborate on that? Sure. That's something that staff has been uh, adding to the negotiations in the last year or two. Um, so the developer is, uh, per zoning, they'll do the 15-year affordability. Uh, for the TIF, they'll extend it from year 16 to year 25. But there's still the, the concern, at some point, when that goes away, what happens? Are we just mm -hmm. in a worse condition? So um, it's hard to predict the future in, 20, in, in two years, let alone 25 years. Um, but the agreement uh, has language that would, that would require both parties to sit down in good faith at, like, year 24 and talk about what does it take to extend it? Does it make sense to either party to extend it, to extend the affordability? Is it something where the project has been so profitable so that they can do it because they're generous and there's credits or something? Or would the city need to do an additional um, uh, buy-in, buy so to speak, or an, an additional contribution? It's hard to predict what the actual outcome will be, um, but both parties want to be able to sit down in good faith and talk about it, whether or not it makes sense to extend it. We also have a, right, uh, a provision in here that if the building tur turns condo, or if it's sold in pieces, that the city, actually the HRA, would have the right of first refusal to buy those units. Um, if it's converted to condo during that period of affordability, we'd buy them at an affordable price and we'd lock them into that price if it's sold um, after the affordability term runs out, the city would at least be in first position to buy them at a market rate at that point. Um, so again, it, it, it doesn't bind either party to a, any particular outcome, but it gives the city two additional options to extend the period of affordability um, to as long as possible. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, so following up the last part of that conversation, and then I have um, another question. Um, so let's say, for example, that there is a sale and the city exercises its right to buy the, at least the affordable units in order to protect their affordability. What's our plan at that point? Um, I'm not aware that we own any apartments or condos. Um, and so I, I would want to know what the plan is at that point. I don't want to go into it just thinking someday we said we'd do this, we promised we'd do this, and so we're going to do this. But I'd like a, a, at least a, a sketch of a plan of what would the city's purpose uh, be for purchasing those units and what would be the city's objective behind uh, purchasing those units and turning them back to livability? Um, and what is the city's role in that? And how long would we own them? Um, if, we're, if we anticipate possibly owning property, how long would we hold them? So I guess I'd like a plan that at least sketched out so that we have an idea of what this body as an HRA would be responsible for if that occurred. Um, looking at the list of qualified costs, um, I really don't have an issue with 
any of the costs except the public plaza on the second level. So what would be the reason why the second level public the plaza, I'm going to take public out of that for now, what would be the reason why the second level plaza would be considered public space? What is accessible from there that the public would want access to? I put a, an overview uh, graphic um, that shows that space um, a little bit. It's kind of hidden. Um, but on the second floor, on the second level, there's usually an amenity platform. And most buildings, it's a private platform. That's where the pool is or the gas grills or whatever. Uh, on the 7200 building, they'll have an amenity deck, but they've designed it in a way where it's accessible from the street. So there's a, a large stairway from the from the shared street, from that Wooner area, to go up there. Um, uh, I don't know if the specifics have been designed yet as far as what specifically is on that level, but it's designed to be almost like a public park space. Uh, I don't think there's swing sets and that type of thing, but it's more of a passive space. Um, but typically those are you know, key card access only. You have to go in through the elevator, pass the door person, swipe your card and get up. This one would be designed completely differently where you can access it basically from a public street to go enjoy it, um, sitting around, you know, recreating for the most part. Um, I don't know if the, the architect is with us. He might have more specifics about what might be there, uh, if that would be of interest. Um, I just, so that's generally I, what I, I guess I'm just curious um, what would draw someone to consider that to be public space? Even though there is a stair, stairway there up to that level, um, it's, it's a place for people who live in the townhomes to get to that amenity deck, for example. Um, and, but I, I just, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, is it worth $1.4 million of our, our TIF increment putting back into this project for the public to have access to that deck. Wouldn't mm -hmm. that 1.4 million be better used on 72nd Street or for stormwater improvements that could enhance maybe a water feature, uh, as was recommended by the Southdale Area Working Group uh, for this property? So. That's that's the piece of it that I th I think has minimal um, benefit to the public, so I, I would look at considering redirecting those dollars to something else. Um, the last uh, I guess the last piece of it is the gap, and so with a twenty twenty three million dollar gap, you fill twelve million of that with the TIF note, and then you've got various and sundry other pieces to put together for eight plus million dollars, including the pad that would be sold for the townhomes. So the the dollars from the sale of that pad where the ten townhomes would go is the the revenue that would go toward this project. It isn't the sale of the 10 townhomes. The developer of those townhomes is going to reap the benefits of that. And so um, I don't know what that pad is worth, but um, I guess I'd, I'd, be, I'd be interested in knowing, is there $8 million of additional funding that's available for this? Is that, is that reasonable? We currently have two projects that are fully approved and had years ago, more than two years ago, that have yet to have a shovel in the ground. And I don't want to see this be a third one. Mm -hmm. You raise a good question about the gap. I mean, the gap is significant. Um, and that's, um, you know, I think if the HRA and council decide to move forward with the TIF pledge, that feels part of it. Um, but then the owner has to do his part as well. I mean, right. so he's already investing the land and his equity in the land. He's got a partner in the, in the other piece of property. Um, but then they need to go back to their additional equity investors and raise more cash. So that's public investment. I'm sorry, that's private investment. Um, and uh, uh, the developer believes that if the, if the city can help with, with the TIF pledge, um, that you know, cuts the gap in half for the most part. 
Um, so they believe that this is a successful strategy to move forward. Um, but again, it's hard to predict the market, hard to predict lots of things. I share your concern. It would be unfortunate if the, uh, if the full funding was not available. Um, but I also think the developer and owner is motivated. I mean, especially with the 7250 building, in its current condition, he can't use it. He's still paying debt on it. He's still paying a mortgage on it. He's got zero rental income. And until that structural condition is either fixed or removed, it's just a drain. So, I mean, he's, he has a lot of motivation to do something on the site. Um, uh, at this point, we'll, we'll trust that they will uh, continue with, on their path of getting the full funding in place. But it, but it, it is a big lift. We, we've seen this for a lot of projects in Edina. Um, uh, it, it's hard to, uh, I mean, the, the numbers, the cost of construction is very high. This site with so much public space, um, you know, that doesn't create revenue. It creates a great place, but it doesn't create revenue. Um, but the developer believes that with this combination of uses and with this building design, they believe they can get it. The, the, the uh, one piece that we put in the term sheet um, to keep them additionally motivated is a deadline, right? So if we sign the term right. sheet, uh, um, our, you know, it doesn't last forever. So yeah. at some point, if they don't see action, our commitment goes away. And, and that's why there's a schedule of anticipated start dates, but firm deadlines mm -hmm. in the term sheet. Um, and the first line item in there is full design and full financing. If it doesn't move forward, it doesn't move forward. And then we are out of the deal. But we want to compel them to keep moving forward. I think the profit motive is uh, even stronger compelling action for them. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, <coughs> Commissioner. Commissioner Anderson. Thank you. Um, uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, is the 8.30 a uh, hard stop? Oh, good. Great okay, good, call. thank you. Um, just to stay, if I may, with uh, Commissioner Brindle's uh, concerns about the, uh, about the, the second level plaza, um, I, I share those same concerns. Uh, I'm not certain as to the public benefit there of that plaza. Um, however, if it were to remain in, and if we came to the decision that this million four was an appropriate use in that area, um, I, I want to be positive that this is ADA compliant. Um, I'm not really seeing access uh, externally there that would have that compliance. So ultimately what that would mean is if, there, if, we, if a member of the public who's confined to a wheelchair decides that they want to use this public benefit, their parking going inside the building, coming in to go up to access it, which would mean essentially that it's unlikely that that would occur. So um, I, I guess I'd want to see um, some assurances along those lines. And then also additional assurances that the weather-related maintenance is going to continue to make that accessible to the public um, 325 days a year, there's probably 40 that nobody would be using it in any event. Um, also, uh, just to um, ask a, a, a question about Commissioner Staunton's comments uh, on the uh, housing extension, on the affordability extension. Um, you know, my numbers, I, I, I look at $5 million here, uh, and I'm assuming that uh, that's created in a fund to offset the uh, developer's expense of the whole beyond 15. It's not a, a financing requirement from the lender. Is that accurate? The, um, the 4.9 million? Yes. Um, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, but I believe that was an estimate of the foregone rent. Mm -hmm. So when you've got 60 some units, 62 units, if you put them on market rent, you could rent them for anywhere from 1,600 to 3,200. They're going to rent them for 900 to 1,200. So it's that it's that lost revenue. Understood. Um, for an additional 10 years for yes. those 62 years. Yeah. And I so, believe that's how we got to that number. Thank you. So my question is, what what's the nature of that? Is do we create a fund to reimburse? Because that reimbursement in years 10 through 25 or yeah, for those 10 years, um, is over $7,900 per unit uh, annually. Um, those 62 units are important 
and that's a, a that's a big piece of the attraction of the project. Um, but my, I, I guess my question is, if we looked at five million dollars and said, what's the best use for this five million in terms of creating affordable housing? Is is this the place to put it? Is there a way to work with the developer to gain the possibility of going beyond year fifteen? Beyond five million dollars can build quite a few permanent affordable housing units, and you know we continue to wrestle with the sundown, uh, the 15 years, and now presumably we'll go to 20 in terms of our policy. We're seeking 25 here in alignment with the terms of other similar TIF districts that have been created. That's all laudable, but we continue to kick the can down the road, whether it's 15 years or 25. You've explained that and we've discussed it. It's just not clear what the ending will be. And that's why I look at that amount and say, I wonder if there is a better use in terms of affordable housing for it. That's a, it's a question. I have other questions here, too, as it relates to the amount of, of the TIF benefit to be received. Um, it looks to me as if we are, in terms of public funding, whether in the in a TIF district or grants that would be applied for, we're at about 13 percent, a little bit better than 13 percent of the total projected cost of the project. Um, the question is, is that in alignment? Is that, is, that an, a, is that the right number? Is it high, low? Um, so the, let me get to the first question yes. uh, first about the five million affordable, affordable housing number. Um, so we're recommending a simple TIF note. So no sinking fund, no additional pools of money um, in the developer's uh, operating performa. Um, they are just factoring in that rather than for 15 years, for 25 years, those units will be affordably priced. So that's a loss they'll see on their books. Um, um, but the city, there's no additional monies to supplement that or to kick in for it. It's just what they build into their operating performa. So it's really just a number on, in a book only. Um, uh, the, the contribution by the city would strictly be at that $12 million TIF note. And then all the rest, frankly, is just the developer and their property manager to figure out how they keep the building running in great shape. Um, for the maintenance on the, uh, on the easements, certainly uh, all of our typical easement agreements require the owner to keep them in good operating conditions under you know, rain, snow, et cetera. Um, and then your last question that it... Um, A lot of them. What was it? What was your last question? I just uh, forgot. The 13% or just oh, over 13% 13 of the total project cost. Sure, sure. So um, uh, we like to, to aim around 10%. Yeah. Um, so this project, uh, uh, when you take the townhomes out of it, it's about $111 million. This is a $12 million note. When the townhomes are in it, it's $115 million. Um, uh, so it's, in that ten, it's on the cusp of that 10%. Um, we don't factor in outside grants. That's, uh, you know, we'll leave that up to Met Council or Hennepin County or whomever. Um, but from a city contribution, 10% um, is where, you know, we would love to be less than that. Um, but for this deal, the 12 million seems to be the right number to make it work. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit higher than, I, frankly, I was hoping to get it down to about seven or eight. Uh, and then as I got more wise and looked in the numbers and understood them more, I was still hoping to get it down to maybe 10 or 10.5. The gap is so big that I, I, I really recommend the full 12. Um, and that, that is about a, I didn't do the math, a 10 and a half percent contribution. Um, but I think that's what it's going to take. Mm -hmm. Um, if you, can I just I interrupt just, just to Commissioner yes. Anderson? I'm just curious about, because we're talking about 13 and 11 and 10 and a half. Well, what, where did you get to yeah, the 13? The over 13 would include the amount that's been allocated in grant uh, uh, requests. That's about two and a half oh, million. Okay. You know, that that would be that in addition to the 12, 12 million. That's, okay. how, that's how I get there. Thank you. And it just seems like a lot. Yeah, uh, I, you know, I get I, it. And I, but it's also um, an outstanding project with uh, a lot of affordability, uh, and that's um, so I, I get um, a little torn between the total amount that goes in and the ultimate benefit that's received. 
but I do want to ask a couple more questions that relate to the financial aspect of this, and because I'm really struggling with the amount of the TIF, and it sounds as if in evaluation going into it, staff was as well. Um, just that you know the sidewalks, the trails, the landscaping, uh, you know these are they're required by city code. Uh, and I, I take a look at, um, you know, correct me if I'm off here, the Avador, Aurora, Aria all contain uh, affordable housing units. They are in a TIF district. Um, do they receive or did they receive in terms of you know, sidewalks and street improvements and so on, did they receive TIF d funding? Um. I, I didn't catch all the names, but the Avador is the one by Trammell Crow and Grandview. Um, they did provide a, like a five-foot sidewalk on the front, um, and, uh, and then a, a, they'll do an easement on the rear, like a 20-foot easement on the rear um, by the Jerry's Loading Dock, um, but they did not receive TIF. Um, their performance didn't require it, and we weren't going to offer it if it didn't require it. Uh, the Aria is the one by Doran Companies, where Best Buy had been on 66th in New York. Um, through, the nego through the planning PUD process, um, we have a five-foot sidewalk there, and then a little park-type area on the south southern edge. Um, uh, TIF was not needed, wasn't requested, wasn't offered, and I forgot the third one that you mentioned. Um, Aurora. 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 Aurora on France um, gave us a sidewalk around the perimeter. Um, and that's it. And there was no TIF needed, none requested, none offered. Yeah. So, I mean, this project gives us a 30 to 50 foot easement as opposed to a five foot sidewalk. So that's it's quite a dramatic difference. But that's, uh, if, I if I got it right here, it's 565,000. Uh, uh, whatever it is in the budget. So yeah. About right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, um, there'd probably be some other things in here, but I. I just want to be certain about the public plaza um, and uh, the, uh, the the total amount of the TIF district, and especially given these other uh, these other buildings and the fact that they found a way to comply without asking for TIF assistance um, is of interest. But there are others that did. I, I, I know that, and at the same time, it can't be totally equal and totally fair. I don't like the idea of setting a precedent in terms of what most often developer expenses would include um, by code. And I, I guess we could go back and forth on the, the <coughs> removal of the, of the building and, and the demolition involved in that. There would probably be, if, if as you mentioned, this went on for a while, um, sooner or later somebody would have to say there's a condemnation proceeding here and a demolition order that would come forward that would support that. That we're not there and we don't want to be there. But I, I just, I throw that out because again, here's over $3 million, what would be typically a developer expense in site preparation. I do understand the gap. I do understand the but for. It, this just seems like a lot. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Commissioner. Um, well, let's, go, let's go right to that issue. Um, um, Mr. Lindgren, uh, we've talked about this issue before with respect to other TIF districts and the uh, percent of the project allocated to uh, uh, TIF assistance. And um, uh, apparently the team has looked at this. The team's recommending that we go forward with this proposed term sheet with the modifications that uh, that Bill recommended. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, Commissioner Anderson's concerns about the, the, the percentage committed for TIF and, and should in, in calculating that percentage, should we be looking just at what we're providing, or should that grant money, potentially from the Met Council or uh, or, or a deed or a MPCA, be included in those calculations? Why or why not? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, uh, again for the record, Jay Lindgren with Dorsey and Whitney, Special Counsel to the HRA. Um, I don't think there are pure black and white questions to any of those. I think, uh, Mr. Chair, among the reasons you asked the question is I do work on tax increment projects throughout the, the metropolitan area. And there, there isn't a strict rule, and I don't think there should be, because every project is done. But typically, I find that 
that the places where there's tax increment, it's somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of a project, and 20 is really high, and it's very unusual. And so I've sort of over the years, and I think among the reasons we sort of look for a 10 percent goal, is that's a, that's a good rule of thumb. Um, I. Again, this is my personal opinion, is that I think that every time we look at a pro forma to figure out the amount of tax increments that's appropriate from a but-for place, we look at the total gap altogether. And typically, um, I find that increment and grants are the final thing that fills a gap. We have a little bit unusual situation here because the gap is still much larger than that. and so. I'm not sure I know whether to think about it as 10 million, 12 million in TIF and you know, and two million in grants or not. I'm more thinking about it from the standpoint that this is a $22 million gap that we can potentially solve by the time do we get to a full redevelopment agreement for your final consideration with $12 million worth of tax increment. That's the path we're on. If we can solve a $22 million gap, with $12 million worth of tax increment, that seems like a very reasonable conclusion. So I'm not sure that directly answers the question, but I'm not on a, we're not down a path right now that seems to me is very unusual or anything like that. Uh, the numbers are potentially higher, but I think, again, they're driven by the fact that at the end of the day, we're going to have to find a way to have that developer solve the rest of the sure. eight or ten million or whatever that final gap amount is. All right. I so hope that let helps. me yeah, let me ask it uh, this follow on question. Uh, at this point in the process, does our team have any concerns, our financial team have any concerns or in house folks about the proposed term sheet? I mean, you're making a recommendation, but what are, you have any reservations about the recommendation? Uh, no, I don't. I, I stand behind the recommendation. I think the developer is very motivated to move forward. I think they've got a lot of work to do. I think it's going to be hard work, but there's no easy project out there. Um, uh, I fully support the recommendations that we have here, with the caveat that we'd add language about the townhomes and get dates in there for the townhomes. All right. So uh, when I look at the proposed term sheet, and I brought a hard copy of it on page seven, we're talking about the qualified costs. And Commissioner Anderson was talking about this. When I look at this, I think about uh, the but for test and uh, the notion that but for uh, us thinking about creating a TIF district here, we're not going to get the kind of project that we're seeing here, a $111 million project on a piece of property where the, where the buildings that occupy that block now probably have a combined value of, of what? $10 million? $10 million. Yeah. So, um, to, to the potential uses uh, and the qualified costs, um, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Lindgren to come back up. Uh, do the, does the fact that we're looking at qualified costs that we can use TIF money for on this particular project create any precedential uh, situation with respect to any other project we might look at uh, at a subsequent time? Does that make sense, that question? Yeah, Mr. Chair, it does. Um, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, actually, I, and I think that if anything, we've kind of we're creating a precedent that goes the opposite way. It, with those charts on pages seven and eight, I think it's important to distinguish that the one that's called qualified costs is a listing of roughly twenty-two million dollars, which are allowed to be spent under the law. But the next category, reimbursable costs are the ones that we propose to you that are $12 million are, you know, that fall within the category that we see as your direction on what does the public get out of this. Mm -hmm. So actually, I think, if anything, we've narrowed the scope to say, well, for this deal, you have these broad statutory costs, but these are the only things that the city is willing to pay for, which is narrower than that list. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say that normally when we present you with a term sheet, we, we tend to conflate those two things, but we did this on purpose because of this issue we've just been talking about, that this is a $22 million gap project. So if anything, I think we've narrowed it not expanded it, so I, I don't see that as a big concern for a future precedent. Okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for that. 
to this issue that uh, both Member Brindle, or Commissioner Brindle and Commissioner Anderson talked about, I, thought, I think it's an interesting one, and that is the, the qualified cost, the public plaza. Um, I see that as a qualified cost, but uh, does it show up in the reimbursable costs in, in, in its full qualified cost, or is it something less than that? Yeah, so we did not include it in the list of reimbursable costs. Again, that first list is, is pretty generous. It's everything that could theoretically be allowed, allowed under state law. Typically, a dine has been tighter uh, in, in, or perhaps less generous than the state law would allow. So we just blended a lot of the numbers together. Um, uh, so, the, you know, the demolition and site prep costs, the streetscape, public realm. Um, when it comes to actually issuing the note and confirming that they uh, uh, incurred the costs, it's not our intention to go down to every line item and find that they, you know, they save 50 bucks on this birch tree, but the bricks cost twice as much because it's a fancier brick. That's not really our intention. So we just lumped all those costs together. Um, but as Mr. Lindgren mentioned, um, the recommendation is is not to exceed a, con a TIF contribution of 12. And uh, if you add up the five items, the demo, the site prep, streetscape, stormwater, housing, TIF-related fees. If you add up the total cost, it far exceeds $12 million. Staff doesn't believe we should do more than $12 million. So um, I believe they will spend much more than that um, on these costs to, to deliver it. That's their risk. That's their job as developers. Um, so uh, if the city can, can uh, help fill part of that, I think that is a big step forward. All right. Could I have uh, Mr. DeVolos or Mr. Margulies come up? I, th I think we should have your input uh, at this point in time about what are your initial thoughts about how to fill the gap that remains if this term sheet were approved? Yeah, yeah, you know, but you're going to have a 10 or $11 million gap. Okay. Uh, good morning, Dean DeVolos, TJ Architecture, 5009 Ridge Road. It basically, as we put this together, uh, we have a billet because it's based on what the developer is going to do with the equity. And so the way we started was essentially 12 million we're talking about the city council. Obviously, we're relying on the, not saying relying, we're hopeful because grants are always a risk because they're competitive and we're hoping for LCDA, Liberal Community Demonstration Account, and D to help out with that uh, process. And then we're also looking for the townhouses to contribute. And since I was set up there, so it was never intended not to build the townhouses, but their own home ownership and those always have to lag. So I just want to clarify that because people want to see what the environment they're buying into as opposed to rental townhouses where you have to accept the environment. So that's the difference. So that contributes. And the rest is some of the equity is willing to be quiet equity, meaning they don't get a return. So when we have that final gap, they're willing to contribute and hold to fill that. So we have a plan to work our way through all aspects of the project on, on that part. But the 12 really helps get us in the game to make it work, and that's what's critical about it. The grants are considered great. We would help, and the town also is obviously contribute too. So we sort of set up in three tranches. The TIF, uh, actually for the TIF, uh, the hopeful, and we're not guaranteeing that, and we've always looked at that in terms of what the LCA could do, the town hall sale, and what I call the silent quiet equity. Those are the four parts of how we're making this work. All right, but, but you agree with what Mr. Neundorf said, that this is going to be covered in a full final development agreement? Yes. We're, we're not going to have any uh, guesswork going on. No, this Once is we get why. To that point about how you're going to fill the gap. This is why we had long meetings with the gentleman, uh, gentleman you see behind us, to really work through how that was going to work. And we went through the performance versus the process. Yeah, so we had some long sessions over in the mayor's room, going through that in detail to really get the status of how all these pieces work. Because obviously, you don't want to take all the time and investment on a project and build it a good job of really shepherding and policing that on a project that doesn't have a chance to survive. And so that was a substantial part of the discussions really working through how do you can make the gap work? How are you going to fill it? How do you propose to fill it? What's the criteria you're going to make it work? So yeah, this is not lightly attended. And like I say, Bill uh, was fierce about really raising the questions along with the rest of the development team behind me. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Mr. DeVos. Um, 
One other question, Mr. Neundorf, I think that um, relates to the, to the funding gap, and it sounds like uh, before we uh, ever, well, at some point in time, we'll have a full and uh, final development agreement that'll cover this gap issue. Um, but for, if for some reason the project doesn't move forward, how do we cover uh, uh, our costs in this process for professional services? But we, we know how we're going to recover them if the project moves forward and everything gets built, then we're going to get reimbursed for the money that we've expended. How do we get paid if it doesn't move forward? Yeah, uh, sure. So the um, uh, so before we start the process, the city requires the developer to, to provide some money that we hold in escrow to pay the fees that we incur. So there's a, a $2,000 uh, flat fee that just covers my expenses and other staff time. Um, so that's already been paid. Um, and uh, the developer has submitted a, a check for $50,000 uh, that we are holding in escrow to pay those fees. Um, uh, if we exceed that, we'll need to get that uh, 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 we need to get that increased, but um, but that's usually how we ensure that we get paid is we get the money up front. Okay. All right. Um, there was some good dialogue, I thought, about uh, affordable housing. How do we handle the problem beyond 25 years? And I'm, I, we're not going to get to this today, but I, I think there's uh, got to be a conversation, uh, uh, some visioning session about uh, how do we provide sources for future funding to get us beyond the 25 year period in these developments where we've made a really valiant attempt to create affordable housing and, and we get it created for a quarter of a century. But uh, I think all of us have the notion that we want to see this continue indefinitely. Uh, and how do we do that? You know, and I'm not so sure the HRA wants to be in the property ownership business, but uh, there's probably a multitude of different uh, ideas out there on, on how you create long term affordability. So that's just a uh, uh, something for and even your neighborhood group to think about, Ms. Melton. You know, how, how do we do this? How do we create uh, uh, a greater extension on uh, on what we're able to accomplish now and, and create affordability for, let's say, 50 or 75 years or in perpetuity? Um, okay, so that's all the questions I had or comments. Um, and did that cause anybody else to have any other questions or comments? Commissioner Fisher. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, so I think there have been some really great questions um, about the details of, of the expenditures on the TIF. And I, and I think, um, I was thinking to myself, well, why didn't I pick at some of those or, or kind of look at some of those items and which are all very legitimate items, especially that public deck. Um, but I guess the way I look at this is, I sort of look at it more holistically in the sense that um, when I saw the $22 million of eligible TIF expenses, um, I'm like, well, that's, those are really legitimately eligible. We could actually change some of these line items if, if we didn't, if we feel like the optics just aren't good. I mean, that might be something we consider, but the reality is there are eligible expenses that are legitimate in this project that more than cover what we're talking about here. And I look at it from the perspective of when we back in the, when we were on the city council and we were looking at a development project, um, it was a, that was a real negotiation over a long period of time. In other words, when I think about what the developer was first coming to us with, it was a much bigger project. It was more massive on the site. Um, and through that process, we asked for a lot of stuff. You know, we want stormwater solutions, not just for this site, but for the, the larger area. We want our affordable housing units and we want less building on this site. And, and at that point, council member Staunton, um, thought it'd be really great to have a street going through their site. And, and we want, um, you know, we wanted a lot of stuff and intuitively it felt like we were creating a gap. And so here we are as an HRA and we see what the gap is. It's really big. This is a big gap. And I think all of us in this room are concerned that the developer has to somehow fill that gap to get what we want and, you know, I know there are folks in the neighborhood that still would have wanted less building and everything, but um, I feel like we got to a spot that was, you know, I think we all feel good about this project and what it can do for our city and, and hopefully um, protect the neighborhood at the same time. And so I look at this, and, and it, admittedly, I'm not, um, I can see already some of you are just, I know some of you are better at the, the numbers and the details maybe than I am. I, I look at it more of that big picture. Um, 
But that's why I feel comfortable that at the end of the day, this is a reasonable amount of TIF based on statutes, based on recommended practices, based on what our team is telling us um, to help fill a gap that still, um, I think still there's some risk here. And I hope the developer can come through and, and I hope they get their grant money and I hope they can bring that private equity to the table. Um, but, but at the end of the day, I think we're getting all of those, hopefully we get all of those things that, you know, when we were sitting as a city council that we, as we heard from our community, all those things that we all want and need um, into the project, so. Good, so based on that, would you care to move the matter? We can get to a discussion if we need to, but would you care to uh, uh, offer up the motion approving the term sheet and authorize staff to engage legal and financial professionals to prepare a full redevelopment agreement uh, based on the approved term sheet with the modifications suggested by uh, Mr. Neuendorf? Yes, I will make that motion as long as I don't have to repeat exactly what you just said. Yeah. Uh, and those, those recommendations with respect to uh, Mr. Neuendorf would be uh, on uh, 3D, I think, in the minimum improvements section where we'd be adding the pad timeline for sale in, in the northern units first, I think. Anyway, we can... You can modify that. So, yes, thank you for the motion. Is there a second? I'll second it, and then I have a and couple discussion of comments. Or comment. yeah. uh, Commissioner um, so the first thing is um, I do think it's important for us to, I think this discussion about the eligible or qualified expenditures um, is an important one, but I want to be careful not to mislead people. You know, we've kind of subtly shifted into we're paying for this or we're paying for that and it's really more of an analysis about under the law what can we legally reimburse them for what kinds of expenses i i think of it um as what are in the what are we getting out of this category to me it's not a dollar for dollar but i'm trying to think about the big picture things the extraordinary not the normal but the extraordinary public realm dedication like the Woonorf, like the cross street um, and some of the extra things that we get on gallagher france and and 72nd that we don't get in other places the the redoing of 72nd street including streetscape the how the affordable housing that's above and beyond what we normally require the stormwater management, um, you know, these are things that I think are all um, in the big picture. I'm pretty comfortable with um, helping on those items. And I think those are significant things we get in return for our TIF investment. Um, I remain a little concerned and, and the, the condition that I would propose to add to the motion is that, um, that staff be, give us a little more detail on the whole, um, townhome piece to this because it just feels to me like we're not I need to know and I think Mr. Mayor you mentioned that we really need to know what the pro forma is on that part of the project I don't want that to um, be an exception that that is getting subsidized by our TIF um, investment here um, but with that I'm I'm supportive of the motion All right. thank you other comments Yes. Commissioner Brindle. Oh, pardon me, Ron. Um, I sent, uh, this is just a, a housekeeping note, but under um, other terms and conditions on page 10, it's small Roman numeral two. The first sentence of that paragraph just needs reworking. I understand the intent of it, um, but um, but it just needs a little reworking. So I, I did not want to approve the term sheet without noting that I would like to see, uh, it's more an editing change than anything. I do understand the intent, but it just needs to be cleaned up a bit. We, like we will certainly do that. Uh, we had a typo, we omitted the word it. That's, um, that's correct. And After the we word will that, reinsert that. the word it. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Anderson. Yeah, I uh, thank you. I just want to circle back for a moment to um, the uh, the affordable housing extension. Um, we consider this at this time a reimbursable cost, uh, it, 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 and it no doubt falls into a qualified cost. I, I just uh, because I'm not certain of the statutes. If if we after due deliberation 
decided that there was $5 million here that's going to be used towards affordable housing. And if we decided to pull that out as a reimbursable expense or, and consider some other reimbursable expenses that are part of the 22 or 23, um, is that something that we can still come back to uh, after this vote this morning? Two questions again. Yeah, so it gets really challenging because we're recommending to create a special affordable housing district yes. with the intention to fund affordable housing. So if we extract support of the affordable units and just pay for stormwater and streetscaping, are we putting ourselves in legal jeopardy of not funding the affordable housing? The, 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 the solution to that potential problem is to create a redevelopment district because these buildings are substandard and blighted and all those things. Um, but then that extends the TIF from 20 years to 25, um, which would still solve the problem. But uh, in my opinion, I don't think we need to extend it to 25. So um, uh, if we're going to use the 20 year housing district, we should fund housing. I think that's the intention of the state law. Um, if we don't want to fund housing, we should call it a redevelopment district. We could change the numbers and redo the negotiation. It wouldn't be the end of the world. But then that would create an additional five years of TIF, or of TIF term before the full value comes back on the tax rolls. So that's a consequence. Okay. Good. All right. Um, I'm comfortable funding housing. I think this is uh, a burden to hand. We're close to it. If we get to a final development agreement, that'll mean a lot more. Um, as to your point you made earlier about what we're delivering to the public, and you, you tended to emphasize the, the taxable value of the property downstream, you know, or the fact we're building $111 million worth of uh, property here, or the developer is, and we're going to get a lot better tax benefit out of it. For me personally, I feel like we're delivering the best project for the site, regardless of our return on investment. And I think Member Staunton did a good job of talking about those public benefits, which are outlined in quite good detail on pages three and four. Of, uh, of the term sheet. And I think that there's some terrific public benefits here. So um, I'm comfortable with the term sheet as proposed. I think we could, uh, I'm gonna vote in favor of it so that we can move on to the next phase. At some point in time, I think we'll have a public hearing in front of the city council on the use of TIF. Uh, and so some of the uh, folks in the neighborhood and maybe beyond the neighborhood that have said, gee, uh, you should have a public hearing when you talk about TIF. We are, by law, at the City Council going to have a public hearing on this matter. Uh, HRA, I expect, will recommend that as one of the subsequent actions here. So I'm going to support the, the motion as stated by Mer uh, Commissioner Fisher as well. Any other comments? All right. All those in favor of the motion uh, uh, made by Commissioner Fisher to approve the term sheet and authorize staff to engage in legal and financial or engage our legal and financial professionals in assist, assisting us in preparing a full development agreement based upon the term sheet, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. All right. Uh, quickly, Mr. Neundorf, I got a 930 appointment. Uh, yes. So um, we'll just introduce the next two items, um, I guess one at a time. Resolution 2019-05 um, is a placeholder. It certifies the existing substandard condition of the buildings. Um, uh, since they are, in, since at least one of them is in kind of a precarious structural condition, we wanted to certify the condition um, just in case there's a problem and there's an emergency demolition order. We want to certify that it's uh, uh, substandard and blighted in case we would need to use that that fact in the future. We don't expect to need it, but I'd, I'd like the insurance of having it. So we, uh, uh, working with our advisors, uh, we prepared. The resolution, we'd recommend your your approval. All right, we've got resolution 2019-05, uh, which finds that the uh, parcels that we've referred to are occupied by structurally substandard buildings. Is there any uh, discussion on that? Or I'll entertain a motion to adopt the resolution, and we can have a discussion. So I'll moved. Second. All right, we've got a motion second on resolution 2019-05. We've already had a lot of presentation on the structural defects. Uh, any further discussion? I would just say that this is a very standard uh, procedure that cities take just to make sure that, as Bill said, you know, if we have to demolish this thing, we can later create a TIF district and it still, uh, because we made this finding, it, it can still be in a TIF district even when the building's gone. All right, good. 
Any other comments? Uh, all those in favor of the resolution, passage of the resolution uh, numbered 2019-05, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Um, and then uh, you've got one other matter. Public hearing. Yes, resolution 2019-06. Uh, this is simply the first step in that somewhat complicated uh, uh, state required process to create a TIF district. Um, the HRA uh, typically requests that a public hearing be scheduled. Uh, we've uh, worked, worked out the calendar and are aiming at March 19th. So this resolution uh, is a formal request of the city council to schedule that hearing. Uh, at the next city council meeting would be the official scheduling of that hearing, but this is that first step in that process. And, and the public hearing is, is the opportunity um, that, that uh, allows the general public, neighbors, residents, et cetera, um, to weigh in on their support or opposition or comments regarding uh, the use of tax increment financing. Uh, uh, our assistants have, have helped us pre prepare the resolution and we recommend it be approved. All right, any questions for Mr. Neuendorf, otherwise, uh, would someone care to move resolution 2019-06, which requests a public hearing on the proposed establishment of the second, 72nd in France tax increment financing district? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Got a motion to second on resolution 2019-06. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Um, the meeting could continue. Oh. Uh, uh, Chair sure, Brindle could take over, but I, I've got uh, a meeting at my office at 9.30 that I cannot miss. So what do we want to do here, folks? I think we should uh, take action on the affordable housing policy since um, the project uh, depends on extending the term to 25 years, which is one of the edits in the policy. So um, I think I do think we do not have to take action today, but let's get a verification on that. But okay. I understand your concern. Okay. But I would ag I would agree that we do need to. T I think we do need to take that action, but we do not need to take we do not need to take it today. Oh, okay. So if we can, if the HRA is comfortable with deferring or at least tabling that action consideration of that to your next HRA meeting, that would fit o within okay with that uh, time frame. Fine. All right. Could we? Um, have a motion uh, regarding uh, potentially amending the affordable housing policy. Move that matter to our next HRA meeting. So, so moved. moved. We got a second. motion, second on that. A discussion. All those in favor say aye. We don't have a second. Aye. Second. second. We did. Oh, oh, sorry, didn't hear. Yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Correspondence? None. Comments? All right. We stand adjourned. Thank you.